I'm Kwame Christian, and I am the CEO of the American Negotiation Institute, and I want you to check out my podcast, Negotiate Real Change. Listen to conversations with leaders in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and learn the secrets behind what it really takes to become a successful advocate, ally, and change maker in your organization. Check out Negotiate Real Change on your favorite podcast player. LinkedIn presents... I'm tremendously drawn mm. to this character of Jack Welch, mm. who I think in the history of the 20th century, you know, if you make a list of the 10 most interesting, important, well, more than that, important people in American, American, of the American 20th century, he's one of them. Absolutely, right? I mean, he is the paradigmatic business leader of the post-war era in America. And my problem is I just don't like him. Mm. I can't stand him. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, Jack Welch made GE the world's most valuable company. Then what happened? Twenty years ago, General Electric, GE, was arguably the most respected company in the world. That was thanks, in large part, to its pugnacious chief executive, Jack Welch. Now, GE is frankly irrelevant. How did that happen? How did the fortunes of one of America's most iconic companies change so quickly? Today on the show, we're going to find answers. And to help, we're turning to two writers who have followed the GE saga closely and written about it brilliantly. Bill Cohen, and Malcolm Gladwell. But before we get to them, it helps to have a little backstory. For that, I'm going to turn things over to my producer, Caleb. On a bright September morning, 21 years ago, Jack Welch, America's most famous CEO, went on the Today Show to talk about not being a CEO anymore. Jack Welch, nice to see you. How you doing? Great, Matt. How are you? I'm great. Take me back four days, all right? Friday morning, first morning you woke up in more than 20 years. You weren't the CEO, one of the most popular and admired companies in the world. How did it feel? Terrific. I just had one hell of a party Thursday <laughs> night, and that made it feel better. But I'm, I'm excited about a whole new life. It's another page. Start again. Pretty cheerful for a guy who just walked away from one of the biggest jobs in business, chief executive of General Electric. Maybe what qualms he had about relinquishing his throne were softened by the $400 million severance package, which included, among other goodies, an apartment in New York, courtside seats to the Knicks, and an allowance for toiletries. But Jack probably would have been in a good mood even without the lifetime supply of razors and shampoo. He had a lot to be proud of. Once upon a time, he'd been a short, stuttering, working-class kid from outside of Boston. Did he catch his accent? And he was a pretty unlikely candidate to become GE's CEO. He didn't go to Harvard, he went to UMass. He didn't have an MBA, he had a PhD in chemical engineering. He got his start at the company with a low-paying job in plastics. But he clawed his way up the corporate ladder. And now, at the end of his career, he could look back, to paraphrase one journalist, safe in the knowledge that he'd put together one of those unbroken streaks of triumph that Americans so cherish. But little did Jack know as he sat there in his powder blue shirt and shiny yellow tie, gabbing with Matt Lauer, that his unbroken streak of triumph was about to snap. When Jack became GE's CEO in 1981, at the tender age of 45, it was already one of America's most respected companies. Founded by Thomas Edison and J.P. Morgan, GE had played a huge role in shaping American life. There wasn't an industry it didn't dabble in. Aviation, appliances, plastics, weapons, medical equipment, computers, entertainment. But that wasn't good enough for Jack. He didn't want to dabble. He wanted to dominate. His mantra was fix it, close it, or sell it. If one of GE's businesses wasn't the market leader, well then they shouldn't be in that business. He shuttered underperforming divisions, cut 100,000 jobs. They called him Neutron Jack. And Neutron Jack was ruthless. He'd put an arm around a colleague's shoulder and say, I love you, but if you miss your numbers again, you're out. 
But as Jack quickly discovered, you can't supercharge a business just by closing divisions and firing people. So he turned to a branch of the company called GE Capital. It started as a small time lender during the Great Depression, a way to help people finance new radios and refrigerators. What Jack realized though, was that GE Capital could be more than a modest purveyor of installment plans. It could be a giant bank. Except unlike real banks, GE Capital wasn't independent. It was attached to GE, an umbilical connection that gave GE Capital a perfect credit rating, something most banks can only dream of. And it used that perfect credit rating to borrow on the cheap and lend for mega returns. With Jack at the helm, GE Capital financed just about anything you could finance. Fast food franchises, power plants, suburban housing developments, home loans, auto loans, business loans. It leased out airplanes and office parks, issued credit cards and sold insurance. And it was crazy successful. In August 2000, not long before Jack retired, GE had become the most valuable company in the world. And financial services accounted for more than half of its revenue. So this was Jack's legacy. This was why Fortune Magazine dubbed him manager of the century. In his 20 years as CEO, he transformed respectable old GE, manufacturer of light bulbs and jet engines, into, I like how the Wall Street Journal put it, a collection of businesses under the protection of a giant bank. To cap it all off, in his last act as CEO, Jack oversaw a bruising succession battle and anointed a guy who seemed like the perfect heir, Jeff Immelt, a well-liked GE insider with a Harvard MBA. Jack was leaving the company in good hands. You gonna dabble in GE? No, no, no dabbling in GE. No, no poking Except the finger around the boardroom? No poking the finger around the boardroom. But remember how I said Jack's unbroken streak of triumph was about to snap? One hour after he walked off the Today Show's set, they came back from a commercial break with this. As Matt just mentioned, we have a breaking news story to tell you about. Apparently, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center here in New York City. It happened just a few moments ago, apparently. We have the world was never the same. And neither was GE. Now... I know it sounds callous to say a terrorist attack that claimed the lives of 3,000 people was bad for business, but it's kind of the truth. GE leased out 1,200 planes and ran the world's largest jet engine business. In the wake of 9-11, with flights grounded and airlines facing bankruptcy, those divisions suddenly had to figure out how to overcome significant headwinds. Then it turned out that GE Capital had insured both World Trade Center towers and all four planes used in the 9-11 attacks, a billion dollar write-off. And this is where Jack's triumphant streak snapped. Not because GE's post 9-11 woes were his fault, they weren't, but because the guy he trusted to handle them, Jeff Immel, his hand-picked successor, just wasn't up to the job. As revenues slumped, Jeff panicked. He plucked jewels from the GE crown like NBC Universal and pawned them for next to nothing. He dismantled GE Capital, except he didn't have a plan to recoup the loss in earnings. Jack watched as the company he served for 40 years, the company he'd built to be the world's most valuable, burned out like an Edison bulb. Now, I've got to confess, until a few weeks ago, I'd never heard the name Jack Welch. But that changed when I read a story about him in The New Yorker by our curator, Malcolm Gladwell. And that story drew on a new book by veteran financial reporter, Bill Cohen, called Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon. When I read Malcolm's piece and subsequently Bill's book, I kept thinking, good podcast producer that I am, wouldn't it be great if we could get the two of them on the show to talk about the rise of GE the cult of Jack Welch, and how a great American company, maybe the great American company, lost its mojo. We asked, and Malcolm and Bill jumped at the chance. They spoke in person at Malcolm's studio in upstate New York. That conversation, right after the break.
The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work, where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award. Get The Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from the leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Bill Cohen, welcome. We are here to talk about your wonderful book. Mm, um, thank you. And there are many, many things I would like to discuss with you. But before I even get to why you wanted to do the book, there is a whole generation of people who don't understand what an insanely enormous cultural figure Jack Welch was in his day. There was a good 20 years where the man was a rock star. I mean, I think the equivalent probably would be somebody like Steve Steve Jobs mm -hmm. or Elon Musk almost, except that, you know, Elon is, you know, seems like he's off the reservation half the time. If you can imagine an establishment, Elon Musk, who wasn't the world's wealthiest guy, but who had, you know, this undue influence on not only business life, but cultural life and the news cycle, that was Jack Welch. I mean, Jack Welch created, when GE owned NBC, he created CNBC and MSNBC. And he would like, he would go on CNBC all the time. So, you know, he was ubiquitous. And he aggressively courts that kind of fame. Right. He, he, he knows what a great quote is. He knows how to give a great quote on the record. He, you know, is smart enough to even bypass the journalist, although he courted journalists. I mean, like I said, he would go right on CNBC and just blither away. Uh, but he also, and this is really important, he also courted the Wall Street research analyst community. He, he was smart enough to understand that he had to kind of seduce them as well. Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones that are writing the reports and making recommendations about GE stock to investors. And so he understood that they were an important part of the equation, as were media uh, journalists, as was performing himself. In other words, having to make sure the company performed. So, uh, you know, as we all know, he either met or exceeded earnings estimates for all the quarters that he was the CEO of the company. So that kind of being able to rely on his uh, financial performance and GE's financial performance combined with seducing both the Wall Street analysts who probably understood the industrial side of the business but not the financial side of the business and so didn't understand the risks that were building up there along with journalists and you know the Harvard business there's probably 50 Harvard Business School cases about GE. Mm -hmm. I mean, they just couldn't get enough of the wonderfulness of GE. Yeah. I ran across a paper, which I'm sure you saw too, by some German, I think it was German sociologists, who talked about Jack Welch as um, whether the adulation that he received met the criteria for a cult. And they were very, they're very convincing to argue that it checks all the boxes. Do you, what do you make of that observation of that we're veer, we veered into into cult territory with him. So, I mean, we have a cult around Elon Musk, right? We have, I mean, you, you say anything, I say anything negative 
about Elon Musk and I just get attacked, mm. you know, mostly on, on Twitter and probably other places that I don't frequent. So I don't know that I'm being attacked there, but you know, he's got his people who are just armed and ready to go to support him and to react if somebody says something negative. You know, we've made a cult of these figures and Jack was certainly one of those in his time, but at a time before we knew that that's what we could do or did do. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how you came to uh, to write this book. What was what, what led to the decision that he deserved this kind of, that you wanted to do, this kind of exhaustive biography? Yeah, an exhaustive is a good, good word, and it uh, almost exhausted me. Uh, you know, I am sort of drawn to stories like whodunits, whether it was, you know, the collapse of Bear Stearns or how Goldman avoided collapse or the Duke lacrosse scandal. You know, there's like a dead body on the floor. How did it get there? And I've sort of learned as I've been writing these, you know, now this is the seventh book, that there's some sort of some liminal tie between my own life and the books that I choose to write about. Like, you know, I worked at Lazard. I competed against Bear and Goldman. I went to Duke. I went to Andover and wrote a book about my four friends at Andover. So, you know, having worked at GE Capital for two years after I graduated from Columbia Business School in 1987, so from 1987 to 1989, I had this experience of GE Capital in my DNA. So... Dead body on the floor and had worked there. And it's a ubiquitous yeah. and important American company that was global and dominant. And what happened? I wanted to know what happened. To be specific, what we're talking about when we talk about the dead body on the floor is that Welch leaves and the company goes into an almost unprecedented death spiral. I mean, death spiral may be too strong a word, but it it goes from being this colossus that's far and away the most admired American company, into being a basket case. It gets, it starts, in the end, it's sort of sold off or breaks itself up. Yeah, it's, it's in the process of breaking itself up, including last week, the healthcare business started trading independently and the other two pieces, Power Systems, which was of course the original business and the jet engine business will be uh, split up into three separate companies and the great corporate Conglomerate. I mean, it's the last great. It's the end of an era, right? The end, of, mm -hmm. fully now, the end of the conglomerate era. All the apparatus of the conglomerate era are fading away. They're going to be moving out of their corporate headquarters in Boston, which basically they had just moved to. Tragically, you know, they're they're selling Crotonville, uh, which is their great management sort of think tank on the Hudson River, which is just gorgeous. You know, it just really is the end of an era. And it's sort of interesting. It's like more of like a slow 17-year mm -hmm. death. And, you know, it took various, I mean, because it was so big and so powerful. I mean, you contrast that with, say, what Elon Musk has done to Twitter, which is literally in a month, it's kind of $44 billion deal is up in smoke. This was much longer and lends itself, honestly, to a, a, a more interesting narrative because it, mm -hmm. you know, it took so many twists and turns before essentially realizing that, you know, les jeux sont faits. Yeah. Had you, before embarking on this project, had you met Jack Welch? I sort of met the ghost of Jack Welch, not the literal, but uh, the metaphorical, because I had worked there. He had effectively delayered it you know, when in his neutron jack phase and, and taking out, you know, 100,000 people or whatever. So even though I was reporting to somebody who reported to somebody, that person reported to Jack. I mean, it was kind of like three or four layers. So there were all always, you know, the commandments were being, the tablets were being delivered and distributed kind of on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. How much time did you spend with him when you were doing this book? Hours. I probably visited him six or seven times uh, at various locations, you know, Nantucket, where he had a house around the corner from me. Uh, he had an apartment in New York City. So you were catching him not only- And in Palm Beach, too. And in Palm Beach. You're catching him at the end of his, 
life, but you're also catching him when the thing that he devoted himself to is coming apart before his eyes. a great moment to talk to him. Yeah, I was going to say that's, I mean, it's so cinematic. It's perfect. He obviously realized that he was coming to the end of his life too. So he was willing to reflect back on his legacy. And he, and I think he thought, okay, this is going to be it. I mean, you know, I'm not going to have another chance to mm-hmm. spin my tale the way I want to tell it. So he, now this is, I mean, this is, we're going to the heart of your book here, but I'm really curious about, um, describe for us how he made sense of the the way everything had, 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 had come undone after he left. To what extent do you think he reevaluated his own time as CEO in the wake of the company's kind of slow burn? Does he, how self-critical was he in his, in his dotage? Do the words not at all mean anything to you? <laughs> he was prepared for our visits. You know, he knew that I was going to sort of walk him through his biography and his life choices and all of that, you know, which was, you know, fascinating. Uh, but he came prepared with sheafs of paper in manila folders to make his case to me about what he thought happened. And he was very, very clear, as I point out, you know, from our very first lunch at the Nantucket Golf Club, where before I can even sit down, he's already blaming Jeff Immelt for Mm -hmm. everything that went wrong. He was uh, absolutely uh, convinced that uh, it was Jeff's fault and Jeff had made all these mistakes and he wanted to make sure that I knew that and that he had left Jeff. And it's so funny, Jack and Jeff, right? I mean, they they become like household names that you feel like they're here with you now. Uh, and so you have to refer to them as their first names. That he had left him with a, a royal flush. And so, in other words, a great hand, great poker hand to play. And Jeff had completely misplayed it. Mm-hmm. So this is... Just so for those who haven't, um, who don't know the kind of story we're describing, Welch leaves in 2001. One. Four days before 9-11. Four days before 9-11. And he goes to this elaborate public process of choosing a successor in which, I mean, I remember I, I was not a business reporter. I was just living in New York. I remember the. You couldn't miss it. It was like it was like a it was like a uh, an episode of some kind of reality TV show. Only it was real life. It was uh, like a daily soap opera. You know that you know back when the days when the Wall Street Journal was owned by the Bancroft family and yeah. really wonderful. I mean, and they would just they just couldn't get enough of it, and that was the way Jack wanted it. So he was he was he had what four or three three. Three candidates. Three. He had whittled it down to three. There were three. others. There were others. Yeah. And there was this kind of public fascination with who was going to get a, be the anointed successor to the king. Exactly. And he, parenthetically, subsequently, one of those who was passed over was um, Dave Calhoun. Yes. Um, who I, I, I mean, not in a personal way, but who I had interactions with in subsequent years. And I remember meeting Del, Dave Calhoun and thinking... First of all, I thought he was one of the most impressive people I'd ever met in my life. And I was like, holy shit, he's one of the most impressive people I've ever met. And he lost, right? So I was still in my kind of, this was sort of still in the glow of GE. I was like, good Lord, this is like the Chicago Bulls in 93. I mean, this is like, you know, you're, you look at Dennis Rodman and you think, you know, he's- well, he, He's not good enough to, yeah. to, to play in the shadow of, Michael Jordan, he needs to go help us, you know, get prisoners back from North Korea. (laughs) So he chooses Jeff Immelt. Yes. Now, tell me a little bit about, describe Jeff Immelt. CEO Central Casting, uh, you know, uh, from the Midwest, sort of, uh, you know, like corn fed, you know, uh, big, uh, you know, when he went to Dartmouth and played football and his father had worked at GE for 30 years in the jet engine business that was based in Cincinnati in a plant, a facility that was underground. So his father worked underground for GE for 30 years. Like during the day, he would never see the light. And the reason it was underground was because of national security issues. Oh my God. Okay. And his brother, Steve, 
became a big time lawyer for an important Washington law firm where he became the senior partner. So the two of them, I mean, I don't know what the hell was going on out there uh, at the Immolts in Cincinnati, but you know, one became the CEO of GE and one became the senior partner of an important yeah. law firm. So he goes to Dartmouth and then of course, you know, frat guy, blah, 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 uh, football, and then Harvard Business School. And uh, his first job is at Procter and Gamble on the Duncan Hines Brownie Mix mm -hmm. account, and his office mate is Steve Ballmer, who of course goes on to become CEO of Microsoft, and then you know realizes that's not for him and makes mm -hmm. his way to GE. Mm -hmm. In many ways, Welch could not have picked a successor more different from himself. So Welch is short, scrappy, colorful, maverick. You North know, of Boston, with the accent with up the, the accent, wazoo. The, and Immelt is patrician, and not really patrician, not, not real patrician, but you look at him and you think, he's, you know, frat boy from football, Dartmouth, you know, looks really good in a suit. Six foot, what, five? No, no, he's not that four. tall. Six, two. Oh, really? Three, maybe in my four. mind's yeah. eye, he's, I met him once. He seemed to be. Maybe, maybe he is, yeah. Maybe. But like, it's not, Welch did not, did not no, it, Welch replicate himself. No, no. It is funny because he would say, you know, he went to UMass and then University of, you know, Illinois to get his PhD. So no MBA or anything, you know, and it's, you know, only child. He considered himself like a miracle because like parents were obviously, you know, Catholic and should have had a big family, but the only child that they produced was Jack. His father was a worked on the train that went from Boston to the North Shore of Massachusetts. And so completely modest upbringing. And he liked to say, you know, he it was sort of like a Goldman, Goldman Sachs thing where they uh, tr always talk about wanting to have people who don't have pedigree and they're going to shape them in the image of Goldman Sachs. They're going to form them. They're going to uh, inculcate them in the Goldman Sachs way. And I think he felt that he could do more with people uh, who came from more simpler backgrounds. So that was sort of what he would say. But he also, you know, also was fascinated with Ivy League types. So yeah. that's why, you know, Jeff Immelt. And it was this weird dichotomy between being aspirational. And so, and as G became more important and more successful, you know, having the MBAs from Ivy League schools, you know, plow through there was important. Mm -hmm. And, but also letting people think like they let people think at Goldman Sachs that, you know, if you come from downstate Illinois and you have no connections, you know, you're, you're hired. Welch says, I picked the wrong guy. And that is the mistake he is willing to cop to. Absolutely. And that's a big yeah, one. That's a big one. Immelt says, I didn't get a real flush. Right. I, I inherited a bum hand and nobody could have fixed it. Um, those are two. And I played it as well as anybody could have. Yeah. Let me ask you this counterfactual. If Welch inherits, if a, if a 45 year old Jack Welch inherits GE in 2001, what's the outcome 20 years later? I really believe Jack would have played the hand very differently. We would not be sitting here today. I wouldn't have written the book and we wouldn't have been talking about GE splitting up. It would still be an important You company. think he could have pulled it off? Absolutely. It's so interesting. That is so funny because, you know, all of us- Because your friend, as your friend Dave Calhoun said in the book to me, and this is paraphrasing, uh, basically every big decision that Jack made or had to make, almost everyone, he made the right decision. Now, Dave Calhoun is now CEO of Boeing, mm -hmm. right? A big GE customer, obviously, for a long time. Uh, and every- big decision that Jeff Immelt had to make, he made basically the wrong one. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't answer the question of whether, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't answer the question of whether Jack Welch in a very different set of circumstances would have still reliably made the right decision, right? You know, Immelt could have made the wrong decision because that is the, 
nature of the difficult and confusing era that he was presiding over. It wasn't on. that different, right? I mean, there were some differences. Okay, uh, obviously, after 9-11, we were shocked into a new reality. Yeah. Okay. Jack would n- never have gotten out of G Capital. He would have figured out to ma- a way to make money in this different environment. I mean, the most successful industry post the 2008 financial crisis, or one of them, maybe with tech, the other one is financial services. I mean, yeah. JP Morgan last year, 2021, sorry, 2021, made $48 billion of net income. You're telling me, I mean, then that was after a string of huge net income years. You're telling me G Capital couldn't have figured out a way, even if their cost of capital was higher than it had been, a way to make money? Yeah, they would have figured out a way to make plenty of money. So that was a big mistake. He he wouldn't have bought Alstom, I don't believe, uh, which was, of course, a big mistake. And he wouldn't have sold NBC Universal because he loved it. So he, he wouldn't have dismantled this thing and he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have, Un, you know, one of the things they say about Jeff is that he unjacked GE, mm. which is, you know, typical of what a new CEO does to their predecessor. They feel like they have to make changes, right? Especially some big, high profile guy like Jack Welch. You know, obviously, Jack wouldn't have unjacked himself. And, and I think he would have, we, we, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here today. So, I'm, in a way, I'm glad he chose Jeff so that we could sit here and have this conversation today. <laughs> In reading your book, my I'm give you I'll give you my response as someone who's not a financial journalist, not a Wall Street insider. I'm largely indifferent to the specifics of these, but I'm tremendously drawn mm. to this character of Jack Welch, mm. who I think in the history of the 20th century, you know, if you make a list of the 10 most interesting important really, well more than that important people in American American of the t- American 20th century he's one of them absolutely right I mean absolutely he is the he is the paradigmatic business leader of the post warrior in America and my problem is I just don't like him mm. I can't stand him because I don't know I just like some part of me maybe it's a kind of function of but you've never met him never met him Never met him. I'm I'm re- based on this entirely on what I read in your book. Mm. I read your book and I'm like, I can't, I just mm. can't. And What part, got under your skin? Several things. But w- one, one thing I want to ask you first before I get into that. He doesn't work today, right? Like he wouldn't be venerated if we do our counterfactual again and we say, we put Jack Welch at 45 at the helm of G in 2000. He doesn't have the same level of public adulation in 2023 as he did in 1995. It depends. He, he would, probably would have been canceled. Yes. Because of his bad behavior. Yeah. Okay. So assuming that he, is, he realized that he couldn't behave the way he behaved and, and avoided getting canceled, say he just, you know, I, I think he, you know, I think GE would still be incredibly important and valuable. Mm-hmm. And I think we would be, he would be in the conversation. Lately, you know, since the financial crisis, we've tend to revere and focus on those business leaders who are worth the most money. Yeah. Je- Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and we love them because they're, you know, quote unquote, self-made men, even though, you know, there's nuances and all of that. J- Jack was, you know, obviously he didn't start GE. He was not a founder of GE. He was a manager. He was more a Jamie Dimon than a, a, yeah. a, a Jeff Bezos. He has the benefit of being a prominent figure in an era where the manager was the kind of, played the starring role in our imagination. The manager no longer plays the starring role in our imagination. It's now the, the entrepreneur, the inventor, the- and, and that might change again, that pendulum yeah. swings back. Uh, but you're right. It, generally speaking, we're, we were in founder mode. I, I think that's going to- be changing now as tech valuations come down. And, yeah. you know, until the next big thing comes along, which, you know, you're better positioned to figure out what that is than, than I am. So I want to engage with, uh, with uh, and this goes back to this question of why do I have this? Yeah, um, this fascinates me. This dist- Because he's so charming if you were to meet him. It just doesn't work for me. I don't know why. But no, so here's the one of the books, a very small book that was written about GE, 
that came out roughly the same time as yours was this book that kind of tries to indict Welch as being the the leader of this damaging trend towards offshoring the dismantling of American manufacturing, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, 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 the larger claim in that book is that rather than trying to figure out how to make manufacturing work domestically, he just wanted to kind of cut bait and send it all overseas or get rid of the companies that were. I don't know how to evaluate that claim. Um, but I do think, you know, now we're seeing a little bit of a rethinking among uh, in corporate America about the trend towards offshoring everything. People are realizing and making stuff in China it carries its own set of risks. Um, and I have a kind of nostalgic... I have a very, when I read about, you know, Appliant City in Louisville, Kentucky, my heart was filled with nostalgia. It's still there, though. I know it's still there, but it's but, like- Of course, it's owned by a Chinese company. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I, what do you think, I mean, did, was there a way in which Jack Welch could have commanded GE, perhaps slightly less profitably, but in a way that protected America's manufacturing footprint? Was he too precipitous in walking away from? I, I think there's a, a whole lot of myth making going on around offshoring and you know manufacturing, you know fleeing the U.S. and going to you know less expensive confines all around the world. Yes, that some of that did definitely happened. I mean, GE was also buying companies all over the world, mm -hmm. so obviously the companies that they bought were doing their manufacturing. In, in their locales, you know, there's still a lot of GE manufacturing that goes on in this country. I mean, it, it, it was all sorts of companies wanted to find cheaper places, less expensive places to manufacture. I mean, you know, Apple has some large percentage of its manufacturing in China, right? Uh, and now, as you alluded to, there are problems with that. Why did they do that? Because it was less expensive to manufacture there. And so the man who broke capitalism, which is David Gellis's mm -hmm. book, which I have to say I did not read because I didn't want that idea in my head as I wrote my book. Uh, I wanted to take a blank sheet of paper, mm -hmm. in effect, and do as many interviews as I could with as many of the principals and 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 figure it out on my own. I didn't want someone else's <laughs> theory of the case in my head. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I think Jack was reacting to a desire to make sure that he hit earnings every quarter that he said he was going to do. And some people, you know, say he did that to a fault. And some people said he, you know, did that in a illegal way. And I don't, I don't think that's uh, accurate. He may have done it to a fault, but that's what his goal was, as you know, like it or not, of every uh, CEO and every company should be to maximize value for shareholders and even creditors. And so, uh, you know, I think he saw that as his mission, like a real, you know, as opposed to the man who broke capitalism, I would say he's the man who you know, reinforced it and celebrated it, maybe to a fault. And I think that, you know, he delivered quarter after quarter what he said, always found innovative and creative ways uh, to do that. And part of that was not only buying companies, uh, foreign companies and making GE global, but to, yes, move some of the manufacturing uh, overseas, mm -hmm. like many companies. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess what I'm responding to is in reading your book and in reading books about Welch, there's a period early on in his career when he earns this nickname, Neutron Jack, because he really did. One of his preferred modes of operation was to fire lots of people. And partially, I'm sure legitimately, this he inherited a company that was probably bloated. a little bit bloated. Um, and bureaucratic. Uh, and bureaucratic. Although I'm always suspicious Maybe this is where my suspicion begins, which is that when you have a company that's in a knowledge business, it's in technology and all those kinds of things, the long-term effects of kind of cleaning house um, are difficult to see in the moment, right? 
when you go on those kinds of binges of letting people go, you're not, it's not immediately clear right away what you've lost when you do that. So the reason I ask this is we have an example of a company which is doing great, 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 and then collapses. One story as well, it collapses because the guy who took over was not as good as Jack Welch and blah, blah, blah. But another story was, isn't it possible that one of the reasons it collapses is that the kinds of things he did to make it perform in the moment had the long-term consequences of eroding the the competitiveness of different divisions, right? Like, so when you fire everybody and you let your R&D spending lapse or you get rid of some kind of middle manager whose who's function you don't understand, isn't it possible that you are setting, sowing the seeds for, helping to sow the seeds for some kind of trouble down the road? So I don't want to be, uh, you know, an uh, apologist or a defender of Jack Welch. I w- I'm trying to be totally objective about what I think happened. And having worked there under Jack and having worked on Wall Street where every year, you know, and, and you know, in Goldman Sachs right at this moment is eliminating 10% of its workforce. I mean, you know, eliminating kind of the bottom 10% of a workforce seems like harsh and cruel and uncaring and but it also sends a message that you know like Voltaire wrote about in Candide you know pour faire un exemple pour les autres you know you're going to kill these generals that lost the war so that other people get the message that if you lose a war or lose a battle you're going to mm. you know face consequences you know you can't have a a workforce that's resting on its laurels either i mean I believe Elon Musk came in and fired half the workforce at Twitter. Now, talk about uh, uh, an overreach, chopping off arms and legs and, you know, like a Monty Python skit or something. Uh, did, is he going too deep? Probably. Did he send a powerful message to the workforce? Ab- you know, absolutely. I'm sure Jack's message, you know, I'm going to get rid of the bottom 10%. And it was kind of, you know, r- r- rigorous. Look, I mean, one of the strengths, you could also sort of turn it around, and again, not to be unempathetic or unsympathetic, but part of the strengths of American capitalism, and there are plenty of weaknesses, we could spend another whole show talking about them, uh, is that people generally aren't coddled, you know? Uh, you know, it's more Darwinian. It's you can't rest on your laurels. You can't put in do a half-assed job. You can't be unresponsive. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you have to work hard and perform. And if you don't, there's always this notion that you're going to be gone. Yeah, but you. I mean, this is sort of what's fascinating about your book, which is that this company really is the the prism through which you can view the story of American industrial capitalism of the last. I mean, you just have. To, you literally don't need. You, it's all in the story of GE, right? Absolutely. It's the it's the kind of. I mean, you asked why story. I had to do it. Yeah, I, I had to do it because it's literally American capitalism in the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to know what happened and what that was all about, you have to understand this company and this story, both the origins, which is why I started at the beginning, and the fact that it almost went out of business, but for some clever financial engineering and the panic of 1893, the crisis of 1893, and the fact that here it is in 2023, the 131 years later being dismantled. Yeah, yeah. If you've listened to the show before, you've probably heard us talk about book bites. These are audio summaries of the best nonfiction books in the world, written and read by the authors themselves. And the only place you can hear them is in the Next Big Idea app. But it's possible you've heard of a book bite, but you've never actually heard a book bite. So we thought we'd share a quick clip. This is from the book bite Bill made for his book, Power Failure. And what's really great about it is he takes what he learned writing about GE and Jack Welch and turns it into leadership lessons that apply to all businesses. Let's have a listen. As CEO, you have to be willing to encourage opposing points of view, even if you don't agree with those points of view. Because if you don't encourage opposing points of view, you end up coming off as like the smartest guy in the room 
and that you don't care about the views of your top executives. And people at that level who feel like they're not being heard will often leave and find new jobs, which is exactly what happened too often in the case of Jeff Immelt's time as the CEO of GE. Fascinating, right? I know you want to hear more. And to do that, all you have to do is go to your app store and search for the next big idea. There you'll find the rest of Bill's book bite, along with hundreds of others written and read by the best nonfiction authors in the game. There's no better way to feed your mind. Download the next big idea right now. Two last questions. Um, I want you to talk about your personal reactions to the great to, to the two characters in this story, uh, Welch and Emil. Um, you've described them, but um, in all of those hours you spent with Welch, so you got to know him. The part he wanted me to yeah. see. So when you came home at night, what did you say to your wife about? Uh, you wouldn't believe the conversation that I just had with Jack. Or you know, at one point we were at the Nantucket uh, Golf Club, which. Uh, was the last time I, I could tell that uh, it was aug- August of 2019 and he died in March of 2020. I could tell that he was deteriorating physically, but not m- mentally. And basically at one point, my older son called Teddy and he uh, it, you know, insisted that Teddy and his friend Zach come over to the golf club and, and sit down and have a beer with him. You know, they came over, they weren't dressed like you should be at a proper, you know, golf club. But they came in, because since they were going to be with Jack Welch, nobody said a word, came in and he insisted they get a beer and have a beer and drink it and just chit-chat with Jack Welch. And I thought, that's it. I mean, that's like the greatest example of his ability to uh, engage people and break down traditional barriers and be, you know, gemutlich, as we might say. I mean, he really uh, got along with people. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I was just blown away by, like all of the executives that I talked to who worked directly for him still revere him, even the ones he fired, like Dave Cody, who lives near us up here, uh, who wanted to be the CEO of GE and ran the major appliance division, which was the worst performing division of the 13 and then left because Jack fired him. He even reveres Jack. So all of these direct reports and the people who were once stepped removed from the direct reports revered Jack. There was something about the way he interacted with people, the way he got people to work harder, to trust in the system and be GE through and through. In contrast with Jeff, so now Jeff would constantly try to make the point to me that he didn't lose important people, he didn't lose senior executives, that you know, he kept the best people around him and that he was open-minded to dissenting views like Jack. But, you know, the facts on the ground just didn't support that. He, you know, people would disagree with Jeff about important initiatives that Jeff felt he wanted to implement, and he wouldn't listen to dissent. And then he basically pushed them out. And, you know, Dave Calhoun is a perfect example of that. You know, Dave Calhoun decided. I don't want to be part of this anymore. The dynamic has changed. Mm-hmm. So, did you like Immelt? But I mean, I didn't like him as much as as I like Jack. It, you know, Jack was more gemutlich. Jeff is very likable, and he's you know an imposing, charming figure. You know, I think p- part of it is pe- people's mythology sort of precedes them, even for journalists and people writing books about them. I mean, Jack had taken the company from 12 billion to 650 billion. He was the CEO of the century. He was, you know, the CEO of the most revered and respected company, the most valuable company. So the Jack Welch mythology was massive. You know, by the time I saw Jeff Immelt, it was actually quite the the opposite. He had been fired, the company had lost a lot of value. He was chiefly, many people thought he was chiefly responsible. So the pedestal was lower and I could almost, you know, see eye to eye with him. Whereas Jack, even though he was smaller, uh, metaphorically, he was larger. Mm-hmm. And I mean, but I think you spend enough time with people and all that falls away, but still their What's it mythology like? precedes them. 
I mean, what's fascinating, and one of the fascinating things about the book is that you have these two men, one of whom is consumed with, not regrets, but dismay at what happened to his golden child. And the other bears the burden of fucking it up. <laughs> right? and, and, and They're both sitting out there in wherever they are in right. Connecticut. Yep. And with, these bur- with this incredible, I mean, it's like, it's, to, to use the cliche, it's Shakespearean. Right, right. And of course, it's especially, I mean, I couldn't, I kept asking Jack over and over again, okay, Jack, your most important decision was who was going to succeed you, right? That's the most important decision that any CEO can make, especially of a public company. And you made such a big show of it. It was this incredible theater that was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for years, for two years. And you had these three pedigreed white men, it's true, uh, uh, you know, that you had whittled it down to. Uh, you had literally hundreds who you could have chosen from, who you had basically manufactured uh, the, these managers, either moving people around throughout the company so they could see different aspects of the company, taking them to Crotonville and teaching them, you know, all these great management techniques, et cetera, and thought processes and, and, and instilling in them your vision. And Jack, you blew it. You blew it by your own admission. You blew it. How do you live with that? How do you deal with that? And it clearly weighed on him, and he recognized and admitted. I mean, one thing with Jack, I mean, he seemed very frank and open to me. I mean, I didn't, I didn't ask him about his affairs. I didn't ask him why he uh, sat in the plane while they were in rural Alabama and his second wife was investigating how her father had died with an ax in his head, which did happen, and Jack, and I, so I didn't ask about that, but the the actual fact of him screwing up the succession process, the one, this great, the irony of this great CEO, this most revered CEO, mm-hmm. making this fundamental error that was going to tarnish his legacy, I just couldn't get enough of that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Bill, this has been so much fun. Um, I can't Thank you, Malcolm. I can't recommend uh, the book enough. Like I said, it's the story of 20th century American capitalism through the eyes of a the story of a very, very remarkable man. So I would recommend this book to everyone. Uh, please read well, it. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Now, we can cut, but you yeah. still didn't answer what made Jack get under your skin. Uh, well, I might feel differently if I'd met him, but uh, that kind of, I just, he just seemed like a jackass to me. I, I, I just can't, I just can't. Have you met CEOs that you like? Dave Calhoun. Uh, but Dave, the reason, Dave Calhoun has, for, I'll just use him as an example. And I like Dave too, by the way, so that's a good choice. He, he seemed, there seemed uh, to be some element of, kindness or humanity in him. I don't know whether that's a, I'm just imagining that, but I feel with Jack Welch, there's a, there's a kind of ruthlessness in him that makes me uncomfortable. And maybe that's just, maybe, you know, and I, I absolutely concede that ruthlessness is very useful in the business climate, but I just, I don't know, I just wouldn't, I just, I just found him a little bit scary. Um, but, and, but in, in reality, in, in real life, in his, when you're with him, you would be charmed by him. Yeah. That's the thing. So maybe it's like, you know, steel hand in velvet glove or something like that. I mean, obviously yeah. he could be, but I mean, in my experience, you know, having worked on Wall Street, I mean, my God, everyone who gets to the top of Wall Street is like that. It's like they can be incredibly charming when they want to be and total assholes when they have to be. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Th- and both those things can exist in the same person, and they're happy to have it that way. They just like they can live with themselves. They don't feel any. They're not torn in any way. I mean, I think that's just the nature of uh, yeah, no, I think get, getting to the top and succeeding when you're at the top. Yeah, yeah. And that's our show. If you'd like to hear Bill share the five key insights from power failure in just 17 minutes, head on over to the Next Big Idea app and search for his book bite. 
It's one of hundreds of nonfiction book summaries written and read by the authors themselves, a new one every day. Feed your mind. Download the Next Big Idea app today. If you can't get enough of Malcolm Gladwell, and really, who can, then check out his other appearances on this show. You can find links in our episode notes. One more plug. If you're curious to learn more about Jack Welch, I've got to say, I loved his memoir, Jack, straight from the gut. Highly recommend the audiobook version. If you have thoughts about this episode, I'd love to hear them. Message me, Rufus Griscom, on LinkedIn. And while you're there, sign up for our newsletter where you can get behind the scenes deets on these episodes and discuss this show with other listeners. To subscribe, just follow the link in the show notes. Today's episode was written and produced by Caleb Bissinger. Engineering by Nina Lawrence, sound design by Mike Toda. There's nothing ruthless about our partners at LinkedIn. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.